Hey there, Josh. How you doing? I'm doing well, uh, Glenn. And you? I'm excellent. I can't complain. Uh, just back from uh, a weekend in Chicago where I was inducted into the Economics Hall of Fame, what I'm calling yeah. the Economics Hall of Fame. That's the list of distinguished fellows. That's capital D, capital F of the American Economics Association. Less than 200 living distinguished fellows altogether. Some Nobel laureates not even on the list. By statute, no more than four economists in any year can be elevated to this pantheon. And I'm in. <laughs> so, Great. I, I congratulated you uh, on uh, Facebook uh, and maybe via email, but it's nice to congratulate you, so to speak, uh, face to face. It's uh, it's great. It's well deserved. And uh, but lots of things that are well deserved don't happen. And so it's uh, great that it happened uh, as well. Thanks a lot, Josh. I, I never tire of talking about it, but that's not why we signed on today. This is Glenn Lowry, by the way, to introduce us, uh, Brown University and bloggingheads.tv at the Glenn Show here at Blogging Heads, talking with uh, political philosopher Joshua Cohen of um, Apple University and the law school at the University of California, Berkeley, and uh, editor of the Boston Review magazine, yeah. uh, frequent uh, guest here on the Glenn Show. Josh, uh, it's Martin Luther King Day yeah. uh, today, yeah. as it happens. And uh, I understand you've been, uh, you know, commemorating uh, the day, uh, celebrating the day in a edifying way. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, I uh, I got up er very early this morning to walk the dog, and uh, while I was walking the dog, uh, I listened to the April fourth, nineteen sixty seven speech, commonly known as the Breaking Silence speech. This is King's speech at Riverside Church uh, yeah. before the concerned uh, clergy and laity, uh, where he comes out publicly with his opposition to the. Uh, uh, Vietnam War um, and listened to it and then thought about it a bunch over the course of the day. It's a it's quite a remarkable speech. And we can talk about you mentioned uh, that you'd read it recently. Yeah, we can talk about what what's remarkable about it. I think one thing that should frame our conversation about uh, th this speech and King is that after he gave this speech, he was pretty much universally condemned yeah. in, by the American press. There were about 160 some odd uh, pieces the next day, including in the New York Times um, that said, you know, this was terrible, at best a waste of time. It was an awful thing to do. And also, uh, this is it's, it's a, a year to the day before King is uh, killed. Um, he when he made the speech, he already was not at the height of his popularity, uh, including, by the way, as, as you, you probably know better than me, in the black community in the United yeah. States. He had about maybe 50 percent support in the black. But in the in the country more generally, um, you know, now he's everyone, you know, from, you know, Paul Ryan's great hero. Uh, but. Uh, at the time, he was pretty much uniform. already before the speech, you, uh, very widely a, a subject of uh, criticism. And so then he gets up and in, uh, in and, and most of his supporters, uh, in, including Stanley Levinson, uh, were not happy about his making this speech. And so he worked on it pretty hard, I think. I mean, I don't know all the details of it. I, I, I would like to know more. But he worked on it very hard. And uh, it, I, I was very, uh, I mean, I found it very moving in, in a variety of ways. Um, I mean, really emotionally moving in a variety of ways. Um, uh, but he begins uh, by uh, giving... As he says, he's, he, well, he says, you won't be surprised to hear, you know, I'm a preacher. Uh, it's a, this is a sermon. He's preaching a sermon. He says, I got my seven reasons for, for talking about this subject. And I, it was interesting because he felt, you know, a sense of obligation to explain to people, uh, including people who were very much supporters of his, about why it was appropriate for a civil rights leader yeah. 
to be speaking uh, out uh, about the war. Um, and, and the reasons range from a sense of the, you know, so to speak, resource competition between Vietnam and domestic uh, social policy, but also the, not to put it the wrong way, but the, the kind of terrible irony of having black and white soldiers fighting and dying together in Vietnam who were not going to be going to the same schools or living on the same blocks when they uh, came back home. And then ultimately, um, uh, you know, observing that his, you know, calling uh, as a minister was not confined by nationality. Um, and that's a large theme, this kind of co it's an interesting mix of somebody who says, I love this country and I'm disappointed in it. And you can't experience disappointment without love. So I love the country. And there's very much of an American idiom, you know, as ever throughout. But a large theme that runs through it is this kind of cosmopolitan theme of um, having a set of loyalties uh, that extend uh, beyond the nation. And that's kind of the seventh of his, uh, uh, you know, of his seven uh, reasons. But in addition to the substance of the speech, I, I felt much more than I usually feel when I listen to a uh, a speech and it's a sermon and it's also a political speech. I felt like I was being talked to like an adult. I didn't feel like there were tricks being played on me. I didn't feel like, you know, there was a lot of strategic thinking about it was like, here's, I owe you an explanation of why I'm talking about this. And I'm going to give you that. Now I'm going to tell you what I think about the history of this struggle. Now I'm going to locate it in the, the American psyche and political economy. And then I'm going to locate all of that in this a moral sensibility around the idea, the, the importance of love. And by the way, in passing, I'm going to, by name, dismiss the Nietzscheans, the Nietzscheans by name. Nietzschean, who think that love is a kind of weakness and then end with the kind of historical, moral, theological arc of the moral universe, truth crushed to earth shall rise, truth forever on the scaffold. Anyway, you got it. You, you, engaged as an adult equal citizen, <clears throat> not as a advertising target. That's wonderful, Josh. Your reprise of the speech is wonderful. And I think your setting of the stage that uh, this was 1967, not 1963, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. had some victories under his belt, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, but it wasn't clear where the movement was going. And it also experienced some setbacks. That campaign in Chicago, I believe it was the summer of 1966, was something less than successful. This was the idea of bringing the movement north. The Poor People's Campaign had yet to unfold. That was what he was working on when he was uh, murdered, um, but uh, might in any case have been a bridge too far. I don't know. I mean, we can speculate what a great man like King might have done, but it was a heavy lift. So I can imagine what courage it would have taken uh, and why it is that a guy, a lefty like Stanley Levinson, might still have been livid. Surely he agreed with King's substantive position against the war, but he thought it impolitic to take the brand of the civil rights struggle uh, and to spend it, uh, perhaps in a kind of, uh, you know, quixotic manner on a uh, protest against a war that indeed was going to go on for an, nearly another decade. And uh, you, wouldn't, you have to wonder what good King's expending of that political capital did, in the, in, at least in the short to medium run. But so he had to speak, and he did speak with uh, great eloquence and power. You know, the, when I did read the speech not so long ago, I read it in conjunction with uh, President Obama's uh, acceptance of the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo. Uh-huh. And it was a striking juxtaposition, Josh. 
Um, Very Ob- Obama wants to say that he doesn't take people like King or Gandhi who preach love and peace and effectively pacifism. He doesn't take them to be fools or knaves. He does not. But he understands his job to be so much different from theirs as the chief executive and commander in chief of the country. His job, says Obama in that speech, uh, accepting the same Nobel Peace Prize that King had been bestowed with, but uh, doing so while, you know, wars were being conducted and more wars were going to more war making was going to follow. He says, I have to live in the real world. I have to be not a, not quite a Nietzschean, but at the very least, the realist. <laughs> about uh, about the nature of, uh, of of the maintenance of global order, he goes on to extol Obama does President Obama in Oslo in uh, two thousand and nine the role that the u s has played in the post World War II global security dispensation um, I mean he says we 've helped to keep the peace he says we 've liberated uh, and uh, that necessarily is a muscular activity, whereas as you know. King is saying stuff like, how am I going to hate Ho Chi Minh? How am I going to declare Mao Zedong to be my enemy? He says, I have, as a Christian, I have to love them. Don't they know the ministry that I serve? That's the ministry of Jesus Christ who loved his enemies. This is King in the speech that you're talking about. He's talking about loving Fidel Castro, Mao Zedong, and Ho Chi Minh. Yeah. Uh, he was ahead of his time. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, anyway, uh, and, and finally, just let me say one thing. I find that this issue of how should African Americans, uh, morally serious people, uh, navigate between these uh, these uh, pillars or shoals or whatever. You know, on the one hand, we are Americans. I mean, this is it. This, you know, we we the six the ship sinks or uh, or it doesn't, and we're on the ship. We're Americans. We're not on another planet. Same on separate ships, but are all on the same boat. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Um, on the other hand, yeah. the perspective that we're bringing to interpreting American history and to prescribing how we ought—that is, we Americans ought to conduct ourselves—is informed by slavery and exclusion and oppression and. We know the dark uh, underside of democracy in the United States. We know that, you know, all the hype is not really borne out in, in fact. Uh, we're, we're kind of in an oppositional position vis-a-vis the American state. On the other hand, it is to the American state that we direct our appeals for inclusion and uh, equal rights and so forth. And uh, that's a theme about uh, how to manage that tension between a kind of national a pragmatic nationalism on the one hand and a kind of idealism and a, and, and sort of moral uh you know uh, criti- uh, criticism that would uh, cause j edgar hoover to get upset when he hears us give a speech you know i think yeah. about that too yeah well that's i guess that's what the du bois meant by double consciousness <laughs> isn't that right something like that something, something like, like that. that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah uh, i just read a wonderful book um uh, Thunder at the Gates, and uh, it's about the Massachusetts 54th, Massachusetts 55th, and the 5th Cavalry Regiment, all from Massachusetts, all fighting in the Civil War. It's a Doug Dagenhart, I think is his name. It's a pretty, it's a book came out within the last year. It's a very moving book, and <coughs> and it's people who are living out you know, in a much, you know, even more stark way, uh, the oh, issue yeah. just describing because they're, they are, you know, volunteering to fight, uh, and volunteering to fight, uh, um, not simply for their own, so to speak, their own liberation and the liberation of, uh, the members of their family, some of them have left uh, members of their family behind in the South, but there yeah. also is a very powerful sense that they are um, fighting for the unity of the country and the moral quality of the country. This, uh, despite the fact that they don't have uh, political rights, 
despite the fact that they are paid less than white soldiers and then go pay. They forgo their pay until the pay is equalized. Yeah. They have a lot of money. These are not people with a lot of money. Right. And when the money is finally paid to them, they got a lot of money because there was a lot of back pay owed to them. And, uh, and they, and, you know, until fairly late on can't, uh, become, uh, you know, commissioned officers. And nevertheless, the, uh, convictions, not simply about the moral rightness of the cause, according to some kind of general principles, but about the, pot- the moral potential of the country is, uh, it's very moving and, and, uh, and, and powerful. And you're right to go back to the o- Obama, uh, King, uh, contrast. It's, it, it's, um, I, I'm not sure. I, I guess I, uh, this is a, maybe a, an expression of a kind of complete uh, ignorance on my part, but I, I, though I, King believed in nonviolent protest. Was he literally a pacifist? Did he think, I didn't think he was a pacifist who believed there was no, meaning that there are no just wars. I would have thought that he thought that, I don't know, World War II, for example, was a just war and probably the Civil War was a just war. He was probably unhappier about some of the, um, uh, uses of American power post World War, uh, two than o- Obama, uh, was, but, but not generally opposed to war. So it's interesting that in the speech, when he, he, he does say that, uh, you you remember it well about Ho Chi Minh and Mao and, and, uh, Fidel Castro. He also, I think it's before he says that he refers to the, uh, the, uh, Vietnamese coming out of, uh, World War II and before they start fighting the French leading to Dien Bien Phu, uh, the, you know, they declare their independence and they're citing the American Declaration of Independence. So, uh, I, I mean, there's an effort to establish some kind of an affinity, not simply on the ground that these are also human beings, God's creature, God's creatures owed uh, an extension of, um, you know, moral uh, appreciation, uh, but that there's a, some deeper affiliation in the yeah. way of struggling for independence. And he also says, and this is important to go back to an earlier thing that I was saying about the addressees of the speech, and this it, it, as a political speech, he says, look, I'm not here talking to um, – the Vietnamese. I'm not talking to the NLF. I'm not talking to the North Vietnamese government. Uh, you know, I'm, this is a conversation between me and my, uh, fellow citizens. And so it's, it's the, the skill. I thought the skill at playing, uh, these different registers of, uh, a, you know, an American of American citizenship, somebody who loves the country and is disappointed only because he loves it, but at the same time has these uh, affiliations, these loyalties is the word he keeps using that extend beyond uh, that extend beyond nation. I, I think w- one of the things to, 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 that I, 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 I I'm struck by after what you said is that it's not a speech in which um, uh, uh, racial identity plays a very plays any role, yeah, plays yeah. A, a, much of a role at all. I no, mean, there, really. it, yeah, it's a, it is, um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, you say "Thunder at the Gates." Is that the uh, title? Thunder of the book? at the Gates. Yeah, I, I really look recommend for that. It to you and to everybody else. Yeah. It's, a, it's a it's a wonderful. Uh, instructive book. And the thing that's different about it's, you know, it's the topic of the movie glory. Uh, yeah. That's is, what I was going to get to. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of the Denzel Washington character and the, and the Morgan Freeman character. Yeah. Denzel Washington is a formerly enslaved person who's somehow gotten himself free and he's there yeah. to fight, you know, and Morgan Freeman is the grizzled uh, sort of uh, drills, uh, the Sergeant uh, ma- major or whatever it is, who's going to be in, 
you know, uh, the non-commissioned officer uh, overseeing the uh, Negro Regiment, the 54th, yeah. Massachusetts 54th. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Denzel Washington character is, is uh, riven by this. I mean, on the one hand, he wants to fight. On the other hand, he hates slavery. He hates white oppression. He's, he, you know, he has not drunk anybody's Kool-Aid. He doesn't believe in all the la-di-da, fairy tale language. Anybody. He's a very, very angry young man. And uh, at the end of the day, Morgan Freeman's message, is, message to him is you want to be free, you got to ante up and kick in. Yeah. You, yeah. you, you got to show up. You got to put your body on the line. You got to fight for your country and ultimately die for your country. Yeah. Uh, but that's what it's about. And, you know, the fact that you've been victimized doesn't exempt you from the need to ante up and kick in. Right. The thing that's important about this book, aside from the fact that it's got the 55th as well as the 54th and the, the 5th Cavalry Regiment as well, is that it's it's uh, less focused on uh, Robert Shaw, who is the commander of the 54th. Yeah. Though it, it's, you know, very, a very moving story about Shaw. And the the Morgan Freeman character and the Denzel Washington characters in the movie are kind of syntheses of the actual. And this tells you the story of where the actual guys came from. Excuse me. Where the regiment went after uh, the. Uh, the terrible battle that's uh, the focus of uh, the movie, excuse me, where else they fought, and then where these guys went after the war. So it's really much more focused on, including, you know, two of Frederick Douglass's sons. Um, Wow. uh, Yeah, yeah. So that's fantastic. Yeah. It's really an eye-opening, lovely. All right. Got my work cut out for me. Listen, let me uh, shift the subject ever so yeah. slightly. Yeah. Um, we're in a transition season here between administrations. Uh, the celebration of the Obamas, of Obama's presidency is being, is unfolding before our eyes on t- screen and in print and everywhere I look online. Uh, <clears throat> Trump, Trump is putting a cabinet together and uh, is getting ready to be inaugurated in just uh, what day is today. Today is... Uh, Monday. God, this is going to happen on Friday, Josh. Yeah. It's going to happen. But by the way, I, I, um, in the spirit of your earlier uh, <laughs> comments about your induction into the Economist Hall of Fame, yeah. there is actually a conference. I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I'll say it anyway. You know, what? there's a conference in my honor on Friday and Saturday at Stanford. So there are a bunch of people coming to give papers and these are former students and former colleagues, et cetera. It's a very, um, uh, and I, I don't know what to think about it because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of people are going to be talking about democracy and then there's this, uh, <clears throat> Um, maybe it'll be a distraction, but somehow I think it uh, probably won't be. Yeah. Oh, Josh. Well, I'm I'm sorry about the un- unfortunate juxtaposition, but I'm very delighted to know that you're being uh, fest shrift. Is that what's going on here? The, the shrift, the fest shrift, is the is the writing, and there's supposed to be a book that comes out of this, and this is just the fest. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's all um, right, and that's well deserved, and I wish that I could be there for that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the juxtaposition maybe is a little bit unfortunate, but yeah. I mean, you know, I'm giving a talk the night before on a topic that I, 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 I think I've discussed with you before. I developed a seminar in my work at, uh, well, about the design of Central Park. And uh, I agreed to do this as a kind of lead into this. And then when Trump won the election, my initial reaction was, you know, excuse my language, how the fuck am I going to give a talk about Central Park as a lead into a, you know, when this is happening? But actually, you know, the story about Central Park, um, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever read Frederick Law Olmsted's writings about the South. This is before he designed Central Park. Never. Fantastic book published in 1861 called Cotton Kingdom. It much admired by, among others, Malcolm X, uh, and dedicated to John Stuart Mill. 
book is dedicated to John Stuart Mill, admired by Malcolm X. There's a wonderful foreword to it by Arthur Schlesinger. How are you featured, Stokes? Did Olmsted uh, know Mill? You know, I I don't think he knew Mill. Uh, Holmes knew. Justice Holmes knew Mill uh -huh. when they met when when Holmes was a young man. They uh, they mm -hmm. met, but the dedication is very interesting because the dedication to John Stuart Mill says for you or everything. This is in 1861 for everything that you've done in service of you know political and moral liberty in this country and. I've looked around a little bit, not as far as I want to, because I didn't realize how much Mill was a presence in the United States. So I looked into Richard Reeves' biography of Mill, and there's no mention of it of it at all. And Olmsted had spent some time in England uh, bef before he did this writing about the South. Uh, so I don't know how he knew Mill, but, but uh, Olmsted spent a couple of years in the in the first half of the 1850s working as a journalist. Uh -huh. so his journalism was all focused on travels in the South. Yeah. And he yeah. wrote these three books, one on the seaboard states, one on Texas and one on the deep South. And then these get synthesized. They're published separately and then they're synthesized into the Cotton Kingdom, which is published in uh, 1861. And the way he saw um, the, the, you know, he was not a very strong abolitionist, at least before he wrote the stuff. Uh, and he wrote, he became a journalist in order to learn more about the, about slavery in the South. And he was in arguments with a friend and the friend would bring Theodore Parker into the arguments to persuade him. So he goes and he writes these, uh, books and they're about how this rule of this white planter aristocracy is uh, denigrates the nobility of ordinary labor is corrupting of this southern elite and also is a barrier to social progress by which he meant just not not just economic progress so one of the experiences that he has in traveling around in the south is an experience of like the absence of great public goods okay Library. like central and park. park yeah and park yeah. So when he's, you know, when, when he and Vox are designing Central Park, they are trying, they are doing this to make a point about democracy. It's that democracy can produce great, beautiful public goods. Okay, wait, so, so he's attributing, he's attributing the deficiency of uh, public goods supply in the South that he uh, witnessed to the uh, anti-democratic character of uh, the slaveocracy there that's and, right and, and what's the logic of that how is it that that unfree labor undermines investments in public goods um because pe you don't have to provide public goods because you can provide them for yourself so you oh, have these plantations but they're all spread around and you don't have to do some you don't have to do stuff that brings people together okay very simple i should have seen that yeah, yeah. and uh, and so and and he is very self, and it, you can see the parallel passages between things that he says about Central Park and things that he says in the writings that he's doing in the South about he thinks that there's great confidence in the uh, in the South, not only that, you know, cotton is king and they can't lose because cotton is king. But also they he thinks they really believe in the superiority of an aristocratic society. Yeah. And so he sees building Central Park as his effort to contribute to the kind of proof that a democracy can produce great public goods. And that if you build it beautiful. People will come. They won't spurn it. They'll want it to be part of their lives. So I decided that it was okay to get to do this. Uh, well, no, I got to ask you this. Uh, it's about yeah. the skating rink. I know you yeah. know what I'm talking about, right? So Trump is going around trumpeting. Yeah. That he looked out of his uh, <laughs> aristocratic window at the top of yeah. Trump Tower down onto Central Park and yeah. noticed that the Koch administration's uh, efforts to to repair the ice skating rink in Central mm -hmm. Park had gone on for many months without success and way over budget. Yes. 
And uh, I, I mean, I mean, I'm only mentioning this because we're talking parks and we're talking democracy and we're talking Trump. Uh, <laughs> yeah. the, so, yeah. so goes the narrative. He decided, damn the bureaucracy, full speed ahead. You need a businessman to solve this problem. I build projects and I bring them in on budget, under budget, on schedule, under schedule. That's what I did here. It took uh, the bureaucrats three years to throw away, I don't know how many millions of dollars and get nothing done. I spent one third or one fifth of the time and spent one tenth of the budget and we got the whole thing fixed and now people are skating back and forth. So yeah. it does, <laughs> does that redound to Donald Trump's credit in your, in your way of thinking? You have to fill it out with the story about the northern skating rink, the Lasker, the name for Lula Lasker, the Lasker pool and rink, which is up at the very northern end of the park. Where and the black people have, are. Where the black people are. <laughs> and, 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 and Robert Moses, who was a racist scumbag, didn't want, you know, the, 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 this, uh, to be, uh, built there. Um, he was no longer the park commissioner, but, uh, it was built in the mid sixties. It's a ter it's an eyesore, but Trump was also supposed to take care of, uh, Lasker pool and rink and he did a much less creditable, uh, job. In the I didn't know that. Yeah. Th thanks for filling in the blank on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, but, but this is all, um, it, it's the story about Central Park is an amazing and great story. Uh, the, you know, the, the way Olmsted described the purpose of the park, was to supply to the hundreds of thousands of tired workers a specimen of God's handiwork that shall be to them inexpensively what a month or two in the Adirondacks is at great cost to those in easier circumstances. Sounds like you're quoting from something Olmsted actually wrote. <laughs> I am. It's a letter that he wrote in 1858. You're, it's, a, you're it's, astonishing. It's, <laughs> and it's a it's a it's it's. It's a very ambitious idea about the importance of democracy and of proving that you can make democracy uh, work and work as uh, without producing lowest common denominator garbage. That was. I think you're ready for that talk. Is it Thursday? I am ready for it. I'm yeah. ready for it. I've given it a lot. But we were going to talk not about Central Park and not about Riverside Church now, but about the... Uh, well, okay. So one probably. thing that has happened the last couple of days is that uh, Congressman John Lewis of Atlanta, yeah. uh, the great civil rights icon, um, has been um, in a, a little bit of a, a, a controversy with the president-elect. Uh, Lewis stated publicly that he did not see Donald Trump as a legitimate uh, president. He cited the Russian uh, meddling in the uh, uh, American elections in defense of his position that he didn't see Donald Trump as a legitimate president. And Trump, uh, on Martin Luther King weekend, uh, tweeted back in rebuttal that uh, John Lewis should tend to his own knitting and uh, uh, spent his time taking care of his district, which was, uh, I can't quote Trump exactly here, but let's just say it was a basket case yeah. of uh, economic and uh, criminal uh, depredation and so on. And uh, then when it was brought to Trump's attention that actually uh, Lewis's district in, uh, includes the corporate headquarters of Coca-Cola, includes Emory University, uh, has a big uh, upper middle class, middle class uh, neighborhood of uh, African Americans, and it is along with some uh, challenged areas and some poverty areas. But that Trump was way off. Trump then modifies his response to saying, "Well, Lewis ought to be, you know, help me out in trying to fix the cities. I can use all the help that I can get." Again, not quoting him exactly, but to that effect. And I'm just wondering, uh, here on the Martin Luther King Day, <laughs> what are we to make? Uh, both of John Lewis's, what are you to make, I'm asking you, Josh, of John Lewis's uh, intervention uh, declaring what would appear to be the duly elected, after all, the Congress has certified the Electoral College deliberation, there is going to be an inauguration in a matter of hours, practically, uh, duly elected president being declared by a civil rights icon to be illegitimate, and what are we to make of uh, Donald Trump uh, and his, uh, and his uh, indisciplined response? Yeah. So I, I didn't uh, I, I didn't much like uh, John Lewis's statement about 
his about Trump's not being a legitimate president and and uh, and then hanging it on the hook of uh, Russian uh, involvement in efforts to uh, move the election. Uh, and there were two, uh, two or three reasons why. I mean, t- first of all, and just in a very in a kind of a personal way, I was, uh, you know, I uh, my earliest political awareness came from reading when I was 12 years old, I.F. Stone on the Gulf of Tonkin resolution and the experience of, you know, uh, open lying by a, a, a major political figure like the president about uh, it offered in justification of some terrible foreign policy venture. And then uh, and then I have a you know, searing memories of the uh, run up to the Iraq war and, uh, 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 you know, falsification or exaggeration, et cetera, on intelligence there. And so I do have a, a kind of um, yes. show me the money uh, on, on point on the involvement. That's point one. Point two, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, what. uh the Nixon administration, you know, the Nixon people did around Watergate. Uh, you know, it was terrible and Nixon got an appropriate amount of trouble for it. That was Nixon. Uh, but nobody thought that it had any impact on the election. I yeah. mean, Nixon killed McGovern in 72. Yeah. Uh, you know, the idea that that this had, you know, it's much more speculative that it had an impact on the election. I don't think it ma- you know, if it happened, it's really terrible and it should be condemned. And I hope it is condemned and not only condemned, but, you know, there's some action to push back against, uh, you know, a, a Russia doing in American elections what the United States has done in so many other countries. elections. Yep. Uh, but, you know, I think it should be separated from the question of whether the victory was contingent on that. So I, I just I didn't like um, uh, what. uh Lewis said, I wish he hadn't said it. Uh, and then Trump is a jerk. I mean, he's, he's awful. I mean, you just don't respond that way. He has no sense of ever, ever of raising himself above, of not taking the bait. Um, and, and he, of course, he knows as well that any bait that he throws out there, everybody else is going to take, and yeah. he can control the discussion by getting everybody talking about some horseshit yeah. that doesn't really matter, instead of the fact that the uh, you know Affordable Care Act is being you know the toilet is flushing on the you know Affordable Care Act. So I, I wish that Lewis hadn't said what he said for the reasons I mentioned. I'm disgusted once again by Trump's. I don't know what the right with childishness yeah. and narcissism and nastiness. Uh, and not to mention, not to mention that here's the guy who was running the Obama is illegitimate campaign. You know, not to mention that. Yeah. It, it, well, it's sort of to me to be part of it, to, be, to hear it. I'm, I'm largely in agreement with you. I do regret John Lewis's comment, uh, which I think is damaging to the institutions. I mean, quite apart from your observation that we don't want to be led around by the nose by partially revealed intelligence reports about stuff that we don't really know what's going on. We want to keep our powder dry. We want to be conservative in the literal sense in terms of how we react to that kind of information. Uh, but also I thought, I mean, it's a crude observation, but I think it's true. Two wrongs don't make a right. The effort to delegitimize Obama, which Trump was a prominent uh, uh, exponent of, was wrong. It was just wrong. Yeah. So it's, you know, how's it get to be right now? I mean, you can't argue we're paying him back. It's not him that's the issue. It's the country that's the issue. It's the office that's the issue. The other thing I agree with you about is I don't get Trump at all. I mean, it, it, it is a kind of personality disorder of some kind because it's just not smart. I mean, it seems pretty obvious to me. I'm not a political operative, but this looks obvious to me. Less is more. He doesn't have to say anything. He's the freaking president-elect of the United States. 
So when uh, during the campaign, when the Khan father yeah. criticizes Trump, instead of saying what he said, Trump, he could have said the man lost his son. The man is a hero. The son is a hero. Whatever differences he might have with me about my campaign pale in significance to the fact that the man lost his son. I honor the service of his son and I grieve with the grieving parent. Full stop. End of statement. He did not have to rebut that. You know, you don't know anything about the Constitution. Here's the Constitution. That was for another conversation. He didn't have to rebut it. And here, too, with John Lewis, he might have said the man is a civil rights icon. I reg he might have gone so far as to say, I regret that he uses the prestige of his office to diminish my uh, electoral victory or something like that. But the man is a civil rights icon. He's entitled to his opinion. I'm going to serve all the people of the United States of America. Full stop. That's yeah. all he had to say. Yeah. You know, and instead he, you know, it, he personalizes it and he uh, uh, denigrates this guy and he reveals his ignorance about the guy's district. And it's Martin Luther King weekend, after all. The optics here are not so great, man. You know, not to <laughs> mention, and just to continue rolling out this theme, I mean, w one observation first, which is, you know, you say you don't understand it. It's worked for him so far. You know, let's not forget that. Whether it's deliberate, whatever it is, okay. it's, a, it's a behavior that he's goes in for and reinforced by, you know, by certain measure of measures of success, by success in distracting people's attention, maybe for more serious things, by getting them talking about him and what he's and also probably by strengthening his bond with people who are strong supporters of his. That said, um, here's somebody who I, I believe, you know, doesn't matter what the Russian he won the election. Uh, he's in, in, in that sense of the term, at least, as, as Charles Blow said this morning, a le the legitimate president. He Charles Blow agreed, you know, with John Lewis in some other sense of legitimacy. But, you know, he won the election, played, you know, the rules. He played by the rules. Or he won the election. Legitimate uh, president. But he lost the popular vote by several million. And his popularity, his public support is in the tank. I mean, in the tank in a way that no one's support, uh, you know, gets in the tank. I mean, you know, other people are running at this stage of the game at 75 percent or 80 or, you know, so, and he's got. I don't although, know. Although, is, Josh, but... just to make this yeah. point, uh, excuse the interruption. No, Hillary, no. Hillary, given the character of this election that we just went through, either candidate who had won would likely have historically unprecedented negatives from the people who didn't vote for him or her. A, a so, fair point. Uh, I, and, and I don't, this is all leading in a direction that I think can, I, I, I think fully absorb that yeah. uh, important observation, which is, I go back to the phrase that you just used about, you know, I'm going to be president of all the people. This is somebody who didn't win a majority of the vote and whose popularity was is running really low. And if he really cared about being the president of all the people, would be, you know, acting in a very different way. There's no evident concern on his part that he is interested in doing what he says he's interested in, you know, bringing people together, being the president of uh, all the people. And that's, um, I think, pretty, you know, when we look, you know, look out at the arc of how this is going to play out, it's, a pre it's pretty uh, worrisome because he's doing everything. It's as if he's doing everything he possibly can to antagonize as many people who are not strong supporters of his as possible. And when those people and people start acting up, uh, you know, uh, so to speak, uh, because he's so deeply antagonized them, uh, then, you know, we're going to get the press, you know, the press silenced, uh, you know, protest suppressed. Well, so very bad. if I were to try to find and I mean, this is reaching a uh, kind of 
rational account for what might be the plan here. The Steve, yeah. the Steve Bannon, Kellyanne Conway plan behind this. Let's suppose that there's a plan. What could it be? Yeah. It might be something like this, Josh, and I wonder what you think about this. Um, amongst the things I said I was going to do, I said I was going to build a wall. I said I was going to uh, uh, unravel the Iran deal. I said I was going to uh, undo the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And amongst the things I said I was going to do was rebuild inner cities and, and reach out to our uh, African-Americans. Now, I can't do that by myself. I need inroads. Every one of the traditional Democratic Party stalwart elected African-American officials is against me, hates my guts, and will do everything to stop me from succeeding. Um, I have to marginalize that set of people. Oh, there's no way to get to where I want to go going through them. I've, I've got to encourage and nurture the uh, emergence of other voices uh, in the African-American community. I notice he's been having some meetings with some personalities, athletes, uh, entertainers and whatnot. And, you know, I, the last thing I saw on my, uh, on my Facebook feed is that Snoop Dogg has announced that uh, he's going to go after any African-American who performs at the Trump inauguration. And, you know, can't be surprised at that. On the other hand, uh, maybe that kind of thing feeds into this, uh, this kind of Machiavellian scheme mm -hmm. to uh, draw them in. Let them attack me. Let the usual suspects, the Cory Bookers. I don't know if Cory Booker did himself any good uh, up there in the Senate testifying against Jeff Sessions. It's not a brief recession. It's not at all, not at all, not at all. Booker yeah. come off, came off looking like, he's, you know, he was a little over the top. He was a little screechy. He was a little, you know, uh, self-serving, you know, looked like he's campaigning for 2020. Is that, I mean, it's not clear. And, you know, this is a colleague in the Senate, Jeff Sessions. This is the first time in American history that a sitting senator has been testified against in nomination hearings for a cabinet appointment by another sitting senator. And Cory Booker looked to me, at least, and I'm basically, you know, favorable to Cory Booker as a grandstanding uh, race uh, card playing politician. So it, it may be that the bait out here is to draw out some of these responses in order to quicken the conflict about what actually constitutes legitimate, quote unquote, black leadership in this new era. Uh, Trump is going to be saying what he's been saying all along. The inner cities are having a really, really hard time. They've been run by Democrats forever. How's that working out for you? Yeah. And uh, the more of the, you know, sort of very partisan African-American Democrats who come out wa waving the racism shirt in Trump's face, both his uh, hardcore supporters will be uh, heartened by that. But it, it may also play into his effort to say, look, I can't work with these people. What do you want me to do? But I can't work with Steve Harvey. I can work with Jim Brown. Uh, I can work, with, you know, et cetera. Yeah. Well, it, it, I, I'm, having, <laughs> I'm having trouble filling out the et cetera, and yeah. that's the point that I was going to oh, make. Oh, by the way, I, Glenn Lowry is not on that list, okay? <laughs> you know, I, I, well, because it, two things. First of all, you know, Trump met with Rich Trumpka. And Trumpka tweeted afterwards that they had a very frank and, you know, good discussion or something like that. I don't remember the exact words, but it was it was a kind of statement that I haven't seen any parallel for on the African-American community side. And Trump was, you know, has been no friend to Trump. So sure. there's a, you know. He, so he could have done Trump, Trump could have done something like that. Now, maybe there's nobody who wants to play. It was a little surprising to some people that Trump was prepared to do that. But uh, uh, so this if the strategy is. To, uh, you know, be dismissive of the traditional black leadership, civil rights leadership, elected black officials, to, to strengthen Trump's support with his core supporters, that, that I get. Yeah. Uh, if it's to get rid of the, to marginalize the traditional uh, black leadership elected and civic, et cetera, 
because there are a bunch of new people waiting in the wings uh, who will, and this will empower them. You know, Steve Harvey, Steve Harvey, Jim Brown and Omarosa. Um, yeah, that, yeah. doesn't seem quite the same as Rich Trumka. So I, I, I'm, I'm having a little bit of trouble unless look, these are, you know, you know, let me just say, these are not whatever they are. These are not stupid people. At all, I, I think the underestimation of their yeah. intelligence and canniness is really uh, dangerous. Um, and so maybe they're seeing something that you know I don't see. Well, well here's here's what I'd like to suggest. I could be wrong about it. Uh, in Trump's tweet response to Lewis, uh, the frame uh, framing was something like, "All talk and no action." Now this is yeah. a, this is of a guy who took the action of marching on Edward Pettus Bridge and getting his brains beat out yeah. for fighting for voting rights. So I don't know how you say no action, but that was 50 years ago. Right. The, the argument was these guys have got a shtick. They know how to demonstrate. They know how to protest. They know how to wave the bloody shirt of racism. They know how to sit in somebody's office. They know how to march. But you know what they don't know how to do? They don't know how to build anything. Yeah. I'm going to build something. I'm going to put people to work. I'm going to get busy. So let the, the more they vituperate, the more they run around screaming uh, that the sky is falling, uh, that uh, the Nazis are in power, the more they do that while I quietly and systematically direct some funds into doing some projects that actually put something on the ground that actually makes somebody's lives better, Four years from now, three years from now, I'm going to be able to point at those things that I actually did, and I'm going to be able to point at their rhetoric. They screeched, they scratched, they crawled, they blocked, they demonstrated, they protested, they sat in, and it got you nothing. They've been doing it for 40 years, and yep. it got you nothing. You may detect from my affect that I am yep. not without some sympathy for that observation. Yep. <laughs> yep. So I'll just confess that. Yeah, so I think the... Um, I, I don't doubt that at least some people, and you know, probably uh, Bannon, uh, think something like that about job creation and circ circum political circumvention and job creation, um, and that that will have a long term political effect. Um, and I have uh, a couple of sources of. Uh, skepticism about that. Uh, one is um, that uh, I, I'm not so sure about the job creation part of the story. Um, I'm much more skeptical maybe than you are about there being a big uh, 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 you know, infrastructure rebuilding, building, rebuilding job creation uh, program. I think there are deep political divisions between uh, Trump and uh, some the Congress, uh, Congress on, on how to do that. Um, and if it's done in the public-private partnership way, not the direct public spending way, but in the public-private partnership way. I'm a little bit skeptical about the employment, that more, more than a little skeptical about the employment effects in, uh, you know, so-called inner cities. Uh, but, you know, uh, so I'm more skeptical about, about that. And uh, also against the background of the stuff around Obamacare, which I think could really be disastrous, disastrous for, for lots the of people. Oh, yeah. yeah. OK. Uh, and then I, I also think the so the ability to build, to do a kind of infrastructure uh, program that creates jobs in, you know, for, uh, you know, in, in uh, for uh, African Americans living in cities, um, you have to. The, the, a lot of that depends not just on how much money you're spending, but on how the programs are administered and who gets the jobs and like that. And 
don't know. I mean, if you're pissing off all these people uh, that you could find yourself dependent on them for delivering the impact that you would like to be uh, delivering. So, I mean, if you had other people waiting in the wings who are going to challenge it, then I, I get the picture a little bit better. But if, anyway, I, yeah. I, I'm, oh, I'm more skeptical. Uh, it's a little bit after three. I, we should we should probably. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, if been, you got another. No, I'm, I'm good. I think we've had a good conversation. There are other topics, but we can have uh, other conversations. We will soon. Yeah. Great. All right. All right, Josh. Thanks a lot. I'm going to 